All right. Welcome everyone to this week's Physics Meets ML. Um, so we're very happy to have uh, Siddharth Mishra Sharma here today from uh, MIT and Harvard, and respectively the uh, NSF Institute for AI and Fundamental Interactions. Um, so a little bit of background. So uh, Sid works at the intersection of particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, and statistics, and he's very interested in developing new statistical techniques, um, especially using machine learning to, you know, learn about new physics. And today he will tell us about one of these, um, particularly looking for, uh, yeah, no, dark matter searches and, um, you know, seeing whether we see something in our own um, uh, galactic center. So we're very much looking forward to your talk. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, having me talk. Uh, so yeah, like, like the title says, uh, I'll talk about simulation-based inference for astrophysical dark matter searches. Uh, the talk will be based on uh, these two recent papers. But um, the, the big picture thing I'll try and motivate is just that these emerging techniques are really well suited for uh, the kinds of problem settings we often find ourselves uh, in with uh, dark matter searches and astrophysical data. All right, so since this is a bit of a broad audience, I'll start with just the, uh, the why of, of dark matter. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence for dark matter at this point. Uh, one of the earliest pieces of evidence uh, came from what's called um, galactic rotation curves. So these are measurements of the velocities with which stars uh, in a galaxy rotate as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. Uh, this can be our own galaxy, the Milky Way, or other galaxies. Um, and this is something you can just compute based on uh, Newtonian dynamics, the formula in the top right, um, if you have the amount of mass enclosed at a given radius. So people did this um, assuming the visible matter that we see out there, so things like the stars and the gas and the dust, um, and you know, made a theoretical prediction. Um, actual observations in the early part of the 20th century uh, show something substantially higher. Uh, so this seemed to point to uh, uh, the existence of, existence of missing mass in, in galaxies. Um, and a way to reconcile uh, these observations with, with theory was to posit uh, a new form of matter, the dark matter, which interacts gravitationally. So it has a gravitational effect on the stars, uh, but not as far as we know with, uh, with any of the other forces. Uh, so other than rotation curves, at this point, we have um, tons of evidence for dark matter. Uh, so things like the physics of uh, merging galaxy clusters, the distribution of matter on large scales, the, the spectrum of fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background. I won't go into any, any, any details about these, but um, all of these points are a consistent picture of uh, only about 5% of the, the matter energy budget of the universe uh, being made up of uh, the, the ordinary matter that uh, we, we know in terms of its particle content. Uh, about 25% is the dark matter, uh, and the rest is what's called dark energy. There's like a, a negative pressure that uh, is responsible for the accelerating expansion of the universe. Um, so we, we definitely know dark matter is, is out there um, in some form, um, but we, we don't know what it actually is, um, whether it's a particle, that's an attractive possibility. Uh, and if it is a particle, how does it fit into uh, the standard model of particle physics with all of the known particles? Um, and what kinds of interactions does it have uh, with the standard model? So this is one of the big, big, big questions driving uh, particle physics and, and cosmology uh, today. This has spawned entire subfields uh, uh, looking for dark matter, uh, trying to uh, tease out these interactions uh, using observations. So direct detection experiments, these are big tanks where uh, we, we try and look for the effects of dark matter coming in and, and bashing against a standard model particle, uh, production of dark matter in colliders, uh, looking for evidence of uh, dark matter converting to standard model um, in, in uh, regions of the sky. Um, and this one last one ba uh, based on uh, looking for the gravitational effects of dark matter and using that to um, figure out what's going on at the, at the particle physics uh, level. Um, and machine learning is interesting 
from all of these uh, subfields. Uh, it's, it's, it's changing how um, a lot of these analyses are done. Uh, but here in this talk, I'll, I'll focus specifically on uh, these last two uh, modalities. Uh, so indirect detection, uh, production of uh, uh, standard model particles from dark matter in the sky, um, and uh, astrophysical probes. So looking for the gravitational effects of, of dark matter um, interactions. Uh, so the last thing I'll say before diving into uh, the the core of this talk is 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 something obvious maybe, which is that everything we know about dark matter um, and you know tons of other things around us uh, comes from comparing data to to models uh, or observations to models. So an example of an observation could be uh, the earlier example of uh, galactic rotation curve, and we might have a model that includes dark matter. Uh, that's parameterized in some way uh, with parameters that I call theta. Uh, some of those parameters might describe dark matter. Some of those parameters might describe the effects of ordinary matter. Um, and the central quantity uh, in, in, in doing this comparison between uh, data and uh, uh, models is what's called the likelihood function, uh, which is the probability of the data given uh, a model, um, in this case, given uh, the parameters. Uh, this is provably the most efficient test statistic uh, for hypothesis testing. And so, for example, in, in, in the example I gave, um, a model with dark matter would have a higher likelihood formally than a model uh, without dark matter. Um, and with likelihood at hand, uh, we can then go on to do hypothesis testing and, and constrain our parameters. Uh, so, for example, get posterior distributions or frequentist confidence sets or uh, do maximum likelihood estimations or, or what have you. Um, in many problems of interest, um, other than uh, some parameters that we're inter interested in, uh, we also have uh, what's called latent variables, uh, which are labeled Z. Uh, these are model parameters other than uh, data, the parameters of interest, which also participate in the, in the data generating process. Um, and in, in many problems, uh, the latent space or the number of latent variables can be huge. Uh, and getting the likelihood uh, or the marginal likelihood means, means integrating uh, over this large latent space, which is often uh, numeric, just numerically uh, infeasible. Um, and this necessitates some kind of simplification often um, of the problem setting. Um, and as the, the space of models and also observations gets more and more complex, uh, we need new methods to, to enable this comparison efficiently. Um, and that's that's kind of the high level uh, motivation of this talk is to uh, introduce some of those methods for, uh, for dark matter searches in astrophysics. All right, so the talk will be uh, broadly in, in two parts, uh, uh, talking about each project in turn. Uh, so the first part will be based on uh, searching for dark matter lensing signatures um, in our own galaxy. Uh, so I'll emphasize uh, how we can use simulation-based inference to go beyond uh, simplified summary descriptions of the data that uh, are often uh, common. Uh, and then in the second part, I'll uh, uh, go through an actual analysis of gamma ray data uh, in the galactic center uh, using simulation-based inference to try and characterize uh, a signal that looks a lot like dark matter. All right, so in this first part, this is based on gravitational probes of, of dark matter. Um, and this is based on trying to understand the microphysics of dark matter from its macrophysical distribution. Um, and here's an example, uh, two different simulations from uh, the Aquarius suite. Uh, the one on the left is from a vanilla cold dark matter. This is kind of a canonical paradigm with uh, GeV scale particle masses. The one on the right um, is uh, based on warm dark matter. Uh, so lighter KeV scale, uh, kilo electron volt scale uh, particle masses. And you can see in the plot on the right, uh, there is less structure, especially on smaller scales. Um, and this is because with uh, in the warm dark matter scenario, uh, you can think heuristically the particles are lighter, uh, so it's easier for them to escape from gravitational wells. Uh, so they, they, they don't cluster as efficiently um, at certain scales. So there's less structure. Um, 
So if we can go out and, and measure the distribution of structure, we can then backtrack and understand if this is compatible with uh, cold dark matter or warm dark matter uh, or warm dark matter of, of a certain mass uh, for, for the dark matter mass, for example. Uh, so this is uh, looking at the macrophysical distribution and then understanding the microphysics. Um, and uh, similarly, different microphysical descriptions uh, of, of dark matter give different distributions um, on, on larger scales. So in addition to warm dark matter, things like self-interactions or uh, wave-like uh, dark matter would, would all give uh, uh, characteristic features that we might hope to observe uh, if we can uh, go out there and measure the distribution of uh, structure out there. So this is much easier said than done uh, for the following reasons. Um, a useful uh, quantity to, to characterize the amount of structure is what's called the, the halo mass function. Uh, a halo is just uh, a clump of dark matter. Um, so this halo mass function quantifies on the y-axis the number of dark matter clumps as a function of their mass on the, the x-axis. Uh, so you can see for cold dark matter, you know, there's more structure going down to small scales. For warm dark matter, there is a uh, depression of structure uh, when you go down to smaller masses. Um, at the larger masses, we have things like uh, galaxies and clusters. Uh, we can go out and, and see them. Uh, if we understand the connection between uh, visible matter and, and, and dark matter, uh, we can characterize how much dark matter there is on these large scales. Uh, at slightly smaller scales, uh, within uh, galaxies and clusters, there, there's uh, structures called dwarf galaxies. Uh, these also have, uh, as you can see on the bottom right, uh, some, some stars and, and, and gas and uh, regular matter. Um, and sorry, can you guys still hear me? Just making sure. Yes, we can, but it's a little bit all, like we can understand everything, but the sound is not perfect. Uh, it's, okay, it's a little choppy. Yes. If it if it gets too bad, let me know. I'll try and search five files or something. Okay. Um. Right. So when we go down to lower masses, which are the most interesting from the point of view of distinguishing the two different theories, uh, these dark matter structures or halos are, are mostly dark. They, they don't have a ton of uh, visible matter, so we can't directly go and observe them. Uh, so this necessitates ways of uh, looking for these uh, dark subhalos without relying on uh, tracers based on uh, ordinary matter. Uh, so in, 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 in this part of the talk, I'll characterize the scalar mass function with just a single parameter. Uh, so my theta will just be one parameter, which I'll call F sub, uh, which is just, which stands for substructure fraction. Uh, it measures the overall abundance of dark matter um, in some, some mass range. Um, so one of the few ways of uh, probing um, uh, uh, dark matter at these low masses it, is with gravitational lensing. Uh, so lensing is, is pretty intuitive as a phenomenon. Uh, the idea is uh, light from some background source is lensed by uh, some intervening mass. So we see a distorted version of the background source. Uh, lensing comes in a few flavors. So in the weak lensing regime, um, we mostly see shifts or distortions of the source galaxy. So uh, the this, this simulated little blob on the left might uh, shift and distort a little bit. Um, in, in the strong lensing regime, on the other hand, um, that should be that circle should really be uh, around the blob. Um, we instead see uh, a more uh, uh, a bigger effects. So things like extended arcs and, and multiple images of this sort. Um, so the, the tons of recent applications of simulation-based inference to, to strong lensing. And this is uh, an exciting field. Um, you hear some examples of recent works. But uh, in this talk, I'll focus uh, mainly on weak lensing distortions. Uh, so collective distortions that are individually very weak, but um, uh, uh, collectively give some measurable effects. Um, and the physical uh, signal uh, or measurement that I'll look at is based on what's called astrometry. 
uh, this is the field of uh, measuring the, the positions and motions of uh, celestial uh, objects like stars and galaxies. Uh, the state of the art here is, uh, was, is the Gaia satellite, um, and this is uh, the distribution of stars and galaxies measured by the Gaia satellite. Um, so I'll play a video now where um, I will zoom in. Uh, this video is from this YouTube link. Um, and show an exaggerated version of uh, stars being kind of propelled forward in time according to measurements uh, from Gaia. So if, if the video is, is good enough, which it, it might not be uh, given my internet, uh, you might see the stars here moving. Um, so the, the basic takeaway is that uh, we, we, we kind of had the golden age of astrometry at the dawn of the golden age of astrometry. Uh, where we started to measure the, 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 the velocities and accelerations of, of stars very, very precisely. Um, and this will just keep getting better uh, over the next uh, uh, definitely decade uh, and two. So why is this interesting for, uh, for dark matter? Uh, so the basic idea is uh, if we have dark matter halos or dark matter clumps um, and they're moving, they will induce some kind of time-dependent uh, motion in the background stars as well. Uh, so in the simulation, the white blob is the dark matter halo. Uh, the yellow stars are just background stars that are stationary. And so you can see as dark matter halo moves through the field of view, um, the stars are seen to move as well. Uh, this is not a real motion. This is just a lensing effect um, on, on the background stars on top of the original motion of the stars. So each individual uh, motion in practice is, is expected to be very, very small. But if we take a snapshot, uh, then we might be able to see lots of little correlated uh, motions uh, uh, in the stars. Uh, and we, we have a population of matter subhalos. So you know, showing uh, four or five subhalos here, all of which will induce uh, some kind of uh, lending effect. So the idea is to be able to try and disentangle this effect um, and then use this to infer the presence of a dark matter uh, subhalo population. Um, so you can see from the previous slide what kind of signal this is, but if I just increase the density of stars, uh, you can see that this looks a lot like a dipole. Uh, it's it's uh, you know like a field from ENM or something. Uh, so the name of the game is to look for these little dipole signatures uh, in the sky. All right, so uh, we want to look for dark matter with uh, measurements of, of stellar motions. So our data typically is um, the motions of stars across some patch of the sky. Uh, so that's what I'm calling X here. Uh, there's two components because um, uh, velocity on, on a sphere is a vector. So these are just two orthogonal components of the velocity uh, of uh, stars uh, bend in some way uh, on the celestial sphere. And then our model is uh, this, this lensing effect. Uh, so you can see our example simulated maps on the top uh, with little, uh, little dipoles across the sky. Um, and, and, and the model involves lensing due to subhalos. Our parameters of interest is uh, just the overall abundance of subhalos. And we also have latent parameters, uh, which in this case are the positions and masses of individual subhalos. So these little uh, dipoles that you see, their, their positions and masses would be the latent parameters that we want to uh, marginalize over if we want to do inference on uh, the substructure abundance F sub. So we're gonna write down uh, a likelihood. Um, and if we knew what all the latent parameters were, if we knew where the, the subhalos were and what their masses were, uh, this would be easy to compute. We just kind of plop them down, um, compute uh, the data likelihood, the X given positions and masses of all subhalos um, and, and check how compatible those parameters are with um, um, our parameter of interest, F sub. Now, we, we don't know where the subhalos are. That's uh, the thing we want or the thing we want to marginalize over. Uh, so the quantity we're interested in is the marginal likelihood, which uh, involves integrating over 
uh, all possible positions and uh, masses of subhalos. We don't know how many subhalos there are. So we also have to account for different numbers of subhalos. Uh, there could be zero or uh, you know, hundreds of thousands. Um, so this is a huge uh, lane space uh, that's uh, impossible to uh, marginalize over uh, in, for practical purposes. Uh, so this is a very common uh, setting uh, in just astrophysics, cosmology. Um, and uh, the way to get around this is often to simplify the problem somehow. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we had a paper where uh, uh, we, we did the first thing that uh, uh, a cosmologist would, would think of doing, uh, which is to take the power spectrum of these maps. Um, so you can look at these maps, take the isotropic uh, uh, spherical uh, power spectrum, um, and uh, see if you can disentangle this over uh, random noise. Um, and that seemed to work quite well. Um, but uh, we also realized that doing so means we are uh, throwing out a lot of information. So as an example, uh, the cosmic microwave background on the left here, which is um, one of the flagship um, observations in, in cosmology, uh, has very small fluctuations and can be assumed uh, safely to be a Gaussian random field. So decomposing this to power spectrum summaries means we aren't losing information. Uh, this is a lossless compression. Um, our signal, on the other hand, uh, on the right, uh, as an example, is highly non-Gaussian. Uh, so doing a decomposition to power spectrum summaries means we're throwing out um, some potentially large amounts of information. Um, so that's kind of where simulation-based inference comes in, is to try and think about whether we can extract uh, more information from these maps than is possible with uh, summaries. Can I ask a quick question on the, uh, just at a very basic level? Um, so when I think about, say, things like density estimation, et cetera, right, I, in principle, would face somehow a similar problem, I would think, in terms of latent variables that I'm kind of need to marginalize over. Um, is, this, is there a different complexity that I'm kind of missing that, you know, distinguishes it from standard density estimation specs, or is it pretty similar, you would say? I think, uh, I think it's pretty similar. I mean, the added complexity is, um, that there is a large and discrete latent space. Um, and I think the discrete aspect adds to some of the intractability um, because we don't know how many, in this case, subhalos there are. See. So if, if, uh, right, if there was like a fixed number of subhalos, if you're looking for like, you know, two or five subhalos, then this is something you could do. You could do the integral and uh, uh, like an MCMC or something. Uh, but because, you know, there might be like a hundred subhalos that are all, all have a significance of like half a sigma, uh, but collectively they give something, then, you know, that's not something you can uh, infer if you don't know how many there are a priori. Um, so the, this discrete latent space uh, adds to the complexity a little bit compared to just density estimation. Okay. Yeah. Um, any any other questions? I'm, I'm happy to take questions uh, during the talk. Not. I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so. Right, this, this is a, a very common problem setting uh, that's tackled by a class of methods called simulation-based uh, inference. So the idea here is we have some prams of interest um, uh, and we have some latent variables. Uh, we can run the simulator in the forward direction uh, by thinking of the simulator as like a probabilistic program and drawing from uh, you know, various distributions, plopping them down, running the, uh, the lens and simulator. Uh, but going the other way is hard uh, because we have this uh, lane space to, to marginalize over. Um, there's lots of recent progress uh, in, in, uh, in this field using uh, machine learning and, and differentiable uh, programming. Um, and um, I, I put this reference, uh, this really nice reference from some of my colleagues uh, that discusses uh, some of these 
in the straw graphs. Uh, so the specific, uh, so there's, there's tons of methods uh, to do this. The specific one we used here is based on uh, what's called likelihood ratio trick. Uh, the basic idea is if we have a classifier uh, that can distinguish between samples from di two different, uh, from different parameter points, uh, the decision function that's output by that classifier is is one to one with the likelihood ratio. Uh, so the decision function that's a number between zero and one, specifying how likely one or the other classes, um, just with a little bit of massaging, turns into p of x given theta zero, p of x given theta one. Um, and in in practice, we can't uh, do this for every pair of points. Uh, in, in that parameter space, or you know, that's highly inefficient. Uh, so what's, what's generally done is uh, the classifier itself is parameterized uh, in terms of uh, the parameters of interest. So now we have a single classifier that can compute this ratio. Uh, and this denominator reference hypothesis can be set to something fixed because uh, for hypothesis testing, we don't really care about raw likelihoods. We just care about likelihood ratios. Um, so given a new new data set, uh, we can we can feed this into the classifier. Uh, we can scan, for example, over the parameter space um, and get the likelihood ratio surface uh, for hypothesis testing. Uh, there, there's a few caveats here, uh, quite a few, but uh, for lack of time, uh, I'm just giving some of the high level uh, concepts. Uh, so the first thing we need for our purposes is an efficient classifier. Um, so our data lives on the celestial sphere. Uh, a traditional CNN, for example, would process data on a, on a grid. Uh, this is not really what we want because uh, this would distort uh, signals in a way that we wouldn't want. So for example, as uh, uh, a signal in the, in the center. Now I briefly lost you. I don't know whether it was my internet connection or not. But it was from the, essentially when you were it's, comparing, you were starting the slide. Well, yeah, was, it, was it this slide or the? No, it's fine. The people it, in the chat it, say it's fine. It, it, it was okay for me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely let me know uh, if there's issues. Um, all right, so. The, the form of the classifier we use uh, in this case is uh, a fairly simple one based on spherical uh, graph convolutional neural networks. So we the pipeline is basically we have our uh, parameters of interest. Um, these are piped through the simulator to produce uh, uh, the data uh, that's convolved with some noise. Uh, this is then passed uh, through to uh, the graph CNN uh, with, with coarsening and also pooling, uh, which uh, tries to ensure that uh, uh, or, or enforce that we don't really care about uh, where the signal is on the sky. It uh, enforces some approximate uh, rotational uh, uh, invariance. Um, this is parameterized uh, in terms of the process of interest um, and is then uh, just you uh, the the test statistic profile. So the traditional method based on the power spectrum is uh, the blue line here. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, simulation-based inference method is, is the red line. Uh, so you can see, for example, uh, first of all, just by eye, it's, it's kind of unbiased. Uh, we have uh, the, the maximum likelihood ratio uh, at the, the right F sub. And also it gives significantly tighter constraints uh, than the traditional method. Um, and the other thing we looked at is the sensitivity on the y-axis as a function of the measurement noise. Uh, so for the traditional method in blue and uh, for the smooth based inference method in red. And you can just see the big picture takeaway is that it scales um, 
uh, much better than the traditional method. Uh, so the, the gain in sensitivity might not seem huge, uh, but in terms of uh, telescope years, uh, this is something that can really add up. Um, this could correspond to uh, many, many years of data taking, uh, which, is, which is expensive, um, and can also mean the difference between uh, you know, not being sensitive versus uh, being able to uh, start being sensitive at the two or three sigma level. Um, depending on the, the specific dark matter model. So there's significant sensitivity gains over traditional methods. Um, so that example was based on a simplified uh, noise model. Um, so some of the um, uh, criticism that makes sense is that real data doesn't look like that. Um, so something we tried was using uh, an anisotropic, anisotropic uh, noise model for our background sources uh, that we got directly from Gaia data. Uh, so this is what that looks like. Uh, this is measurement noise in the two uh, orthogonal directions. And for example, you can see that uh, you don't really measure anything along the plane and the measurement noise is, is quite a bit worse close to the plane. Uh, that's because there's just um, a lot of obstruction from the plane of the galaxy. Um, and uh, the noise just also depends on the scanning pattern of the, uh, the satellite. Um, so with this model, we, we again found that the method works uh, just, uh, just as well. Um, the, the teal line is, uh, if we know exactly what the uh, noise model is, uh, we can get even tighter constraints, uh, which we, we generally do have uh, a model for uh, the, the measurement noise. Um, whereas if uh, we have unmodeled noise, uh, we, we, we can still do quite well, which is the dotted T line, uh, which was a little bit surprising, uh, but it seems to work quite well, even if uh, our test sample is a little bit out of distribution. Uh, and the final thing we looked at is uh, a test of statistical coverage. Uh, this is a consistency check to make sure that the, the estimator is not biased or over, overconfident. Um, it, it's statistically sound. Um, and this was inspired by, by this paper uh, by Her uh, Hermans et al. Um, in, the, in the lower right. Um, so the idea is we, we simulate uh, samples from uh, the joint data parameter distribution, compute the likelihood ratio <clears throat> profiles, um, and then for a given uh, nominal confidence level on the x-axis, uh, compute the fraction of samples whose uh, true parameter falls within the test statistic uh, confidence interval uh, for a large number of samples. And we do this for a large number of samples. Um, and if this curve falls below the dotted line, that's saying we have an overconfident estimator. So it has uh, the, the capacity to, uh, for example, exclude uh, a model that shouldn't be excluded. Um, whereas uh, staying on top of the, the diagonal uh, line means the estimator is conservative. So it, uh, in other words, it has uh, coverage. Uh, but we found that the estimator seems to be uh, on the slightly conservative side, uh, which is just a reassuring check. Um, all right, I think that's all I had to say about uh, this part. Uh, before moving on to the second part, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if, if there are any. Yeah, I have a, I have a quick question. Um, so in terms of, um, uh, yeah, so real, real observations, right, will have like, you know, different, maybe only uh, cover parts of the sky, et cetera, and also like look at it at different time, like, you know, for different lengths of time. Um, so is this something you've looked at already in the sense of like folding that in, or is this something, you know, down the line? How much do you lose when you just look at the subset of the sky essentially? Do you have, um... Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this anisotropic, model um, does address some of that. Um, so for example, uh, the plane doesn't have uh, any, any data in this case. The noise is essentially infinite uh, and was masked out. 
um, and uh, the aspect about different patches being being uh, scanned for different periods of time. Uh, that's also in this uh, noise model. So uh, the parts that are uh, blue have smaller noise. It doesn't correlate exactly to the scanning pattern because there's a few different effects um, at play. Uh, but this does partly uh, take that into account. Um, but so, for example, uh, a natural question is: in this case, we're looking at not stars in the galaxy, but actually quasars, which are these like faraway uh, uh, galaxies, which look essentially point-like. And because they're very far away, their intrinsic motion is is going to be very small. Uh, so, if there's a, a lensing effect, it's easier to disentangle. Uh, the other interesting application is to, to stars in our galaxy. And in that case, uh, they're not expected to have a high density over the entire sky. Uh, they will be mostly concentrated um, along the plane. Uh, so, so in that case, I would expect actually like uh, a spherical CNN is probably not uh, the best thing to use as a feature extractor. Because um, yeah, I mean, the, the data does not lie in the right part of the sky. Um, so that's yeah, some, that's something to be looked at. Uh, is there a question from Yashar? Yeah, um, I see. It. Uh, so um, the I guess my question relates to the coverage probabilities that you showed, and 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 also kind of this choice of. Um, kind of like ratio estimation is that so these ratio estimators are basically. Uh, in the limit of perfect performance of these neural networks would be kind of like, you know, kind of converge to the thing. But in reality, there could be kind of like, yeah, it's, there, there is a source of error that is kind of like not accounted for from basically having biased estimation of these ratios in, 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 from, from these neural nets. And, they, and I guess that's what probably leaks into these kind of like non-perfect kind of like coverages, which is, it's good that it's on the conservative side, but still it's not on the diagonal line. Um, I guess I have kind of like two questions there. Like one is kind of like, how can we kind of deal with that added uncertainty? How could we include that added uncertainty in these kind of like ratio estimations? Is there a way path forward? And then the other one is that these coverage probabilities are kind of like um, averaged out over the entire data space, but it's possible that kind of like certain regions of this like parameter space are also like hugely kind of like, maybe like overconfident and they're just being, washed out by kind of like other regions being conservative. Is there kind of like a worry about that somehow? Yeah, thanks for uh, the questions. These are good questions. Um, so the first question was, is there a way to include the certainty due to imperfect classification, for example, in the, in the ratio estimator uh, downstream in this test of statistical coverage? Um, that seems a little bit maybe like the wrong way to look at it, um, I think to me. Um, I'd, I'd say maybe this test of coverage is um, a test of how uh, well or not well uh, the classifier was trained. Um, so yeah, it's, it's giving some idea about that. Uh, there are ways that I know people are working on, and this is, um, definitely like an active topic of research to force uh, the ratio estimator to be conservative. Um, uh, a simple way is to do a calibration, uh, which you probably know about, uh, is just after the fact, uh, you know, evaluating lots and lots of points uh, in the parameter space and then having a correction factor uh, in the likelihood ratio. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I don't know how to include uh, the imperfection downstream, but I would think this is a test of that imperfection. Um, and if you can make the classifier better or force it to be conservative, um, that would then show up correspondingly in this kind of test. Um, what was the second question? Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, the second question was the fact that the, the, the coverage probabilities are kind of like, Ensemble or average out average. of the entire like parameter space rather than locally kind of knowing that. Yeah, yeah that's a that's a great question. Um, I I uh, don't think I have a good response to that other than you maybe want to like 
being in parameter space and then uh, uh, ch check this separately for different parts. Yeah, this is some kind of uh, marginal uh, coverage. So it, it's possible that you have biases in specific points of parameter space, definitely. Yeah. Sorry, so while we're at it, I'll ask a third question too. Uh, do you think there's ever kind of any any possibility? I, and I know in the current framework it's not, but 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 are you aware of like any possibility where you would have uh, kind of access, like kind of you know access to the simulations that are basically have gone that are consistent with like a particular um, inference? So so you know like an example of that like is you know so if you were instead of kind of these like neural ratio things, if you were doing ABC. And we would have kind of like access to which simulations specifically are consistent with the data that we have. So here we've kind of lost track of that because we've basically fit a model to that um, to that surface. And so we have access to the model, which is what makes things like efficient and, and, and great and, and, and continuous. But also, is there any possibility of kind of like having some mechanism that kind of can retrieve kind of like what are the simulations also, the, the specific simulations that were used in the in the training? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and I don't think this is necessarily specific to simulation-based inference, uh, right? You could ask this for any kind of neural network-based uh, feature extractor or a classifier or something. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know of some methods that I've seen recently in the kind of interpretability, explainability space that um, tries to extract uh, elements of the, the training set that are closest to a given data set. Uh, it's not in the context of um, SBI or, or ratio estimation or anything, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'd be happy to dig those up uh, if you're interested. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, any more questions? If not, I'll move on to, to this next part. Uh, it should, hopefully it should be okay on, on, on time. Um, okay, so, so in this part, um, I'll describe an analysis of data uh, of uh, gamma rays from the Galactic Center. Um, and this is worked on uh, together with uh, Kyle Kramer. Uh, so the idea here is uh, we, or the physics motivation, we don't know uh, what dark matter is or how it interacts with the standard model, uh, but one of the canonical uh, paradigms is of the so-called weakly interacting massive particle or the WIMP, uh, where uh, there's assumed to be some weak scale interaction between the standard and dark sectors. Uh, this also naturally explains how dark matter came to be in the early universe um, and uh, why it exists in the quantities that we see uh, today. Uh, so this can lead, for example, to these kinds of uh, interconversions between the dark and, and standard uh, sectors uh, through uh, annihilation processes. Um, so what this means is if we look at uh, regions of the sky that have a lot of dark matter uh, and the center of the galaxy uh, or galaxies in general um, is uh, a good place for that, we might expect to see uh, byproduct of this annihilation. So dark matter annihilating into a standard model, uh, which then cascades on through some standard processes into photons. And just because of these, some of the energy scales uh, involved in this process, the kind of signal that we'd see would be expected to be in the uh, giga electron volt energy range. So this is gamma rays. Uh, so this is uh, a simulation of what this kind of signal might look like. Uh, the Fermi satellite is a gamma satellite that's well suited to looking for these kinds of signals. Um, and here we might expect uh, some uh, specific energy spectrum um, over the background as well. Uh, that depends on the kinematics of this uh, annihilation process. And um, kind of intriguingly, uh, exactly such a signal was found uh, in uh, over a decade ago now. Uh, from the center of the galaxy uh, using data from the Fermi uh, telescope. Uh, this is a spherically symmetric excess uh, that extends about 10 degrees from the center of the galaxy, uh, constitutes about 10% of the, the flux in, the, in this region. Uh, spatial morphology uh, is, is broadly consistent with what you might expect from, from dark matter, uh, which is what was shown here. 
And also its energy spectrum is uh, seems to be consistent with what you might expect uh, from dark matter. So these data points, for example, are the uh, is a spectrum attributed to the excess, and uh, the solid line is um, uh, an expectation from dark matter annihilation for a specific model. And you can see that they visually at least seem to, uh, seem to match up quite well. So how does one do such an analysis? I'll, I'll just describe this from like a, a modeling point of view a little bit. So this is the gamma ray sky in the two to 20 giga electron volts energy range. It's got a bunch of components that we want to model. Uh, you can see these little specs. Uh, these are resolved point sources. So individual astrophysical objects uh, that emit brightly in, in gamma rays. Uh, you can see this bright emission along the galactic plane. Uh, this is uh, um, a big background for these kinds of searches. Uh, this comes from cosmic rays coming in and interacting with the, with the gas and the dust in the galaxy. Um, and there's also an isotropic emission uh, from extragalactic sources. Uh, there's no preferred direction here, so they kind of just emit um, in, in, uh, isotropically uh, from our point of view. Uh, the region we're interested in is the galactic center, and here's what uh, the data in this galactic center region uh, looks like. And you know, we'd be interested in looking for dark matter in this region. So the way these analyses are done typically is with templates. So the, the individual emission components are modeled using spatial templates. So for example, uh, this template called uh, the bubble template. This is just an astrophysical uh, component. Uh, don't worry too much about that. Uh, isotropic point sources uh, allowing for dark matter and a model for the diffuse emission. Uh, in, in particular, the diffuse emission makes up uh, over 80% of this uh, of the emission in this region. And the parameters in this case are the normalizations of the uh, individual templates. And the data is assumed to be uh, a Poisson realization of the sum of these templates. Uh, the data is just in, in, in counts that are binned uh, um, with some pixelization. Uh, this galactic background, because it is so big, uh, it was just uh, mentioning where it comes from. Uh, so this is model, this is this comes from various processes. So for example, uh, the cosmic microwave background coming in and uh, upscattering against um, uh, populations of uh, charge carriers in the galaxy. Uh, Boosted pion decay, uh, Bremsstrahlung. Uh, it's not super important, but uh, there's a ton of modeling that goes into trying to understand what this diffuse background um, is like. Um, and this is a 3D radiation transfer problem. Um, and we don't know what the galaxy looks like in 3D. Uh, so there's, there's a ton of modeling here, and uh, it's not hard to, to be off uh, uh, with this component, uh, which will be important in a bit. All right, so I, I like to think of things in terms of probabilistic models, uh, even for simple models like this, just to expose some of the, the assumptions that, that go in. Um, so in this case, the parameters are the normalizations of the individual uh, templates. Oops, right, no, uh, that, that's in the, uh, the green circles. Uh, in a Bayesian framework, these are assumed to be uh, drawn from some priors. Uh, those are the, the boxes. Uh, these are uh, convolved um, with the templates, which are then combined to form a realization of the data. Um, and uh, the data is assumed to be uh, uh, some, some likelihood that depends on the sum of templates. Um, a reasonable assumption that's, uh, that's often made is that of pixel-wise conditional independence. Um, so here it's assumed that each pixel is conditionally independent given the templates. Um, and this is kind of reasonable because once you specify the templates, what happens in the given pixel just depends on what the sum of templates looks like in that pixel. Um, and in this case, the, the probability uh, reduces to uh, a product of Poisson probabilities um, in, in the individual uh, pixels. Um, and that's what I specified with the uh, rectangle here with the with the p pixel index going from one to the number of pixels, um, and this is just specifying that there's n pix different copies of this part of the model. All right, so I've, I focused on the dark matter explanation so far, uh, but the and you know the uh, the excess is certainly broadly compatible with with dark matter. 
uh, but, but kind of annoyingly, the excess is also compatible with uh, astrophysical uh, explanations. Uh, uh, the major one being a uh, population of uh, point sources, for example, millisecond pulsars. So again, it's, it's energy spectrum uh, and also spatial distribution is broadly seem to be consistent with what you might expect uh, from that case. So how do we distinguish uh, uh, dark matter from astrophysics? Uh, the good news is there is a handle. Um, so in the dark matter case, we generally expect a smoother signal uh, then if we have a population of unresolved point sources that um, are individually at least moderately bright. Uh, in that case, we might expect something like what's on the right here, so a clumpier signal. Um, so what kinds of point sources can we actually uh, distinguish? So if we have uh, lots of really bright point sources, uh, that's on the right here. So I'm, I'm plotting uh, just the scale of uh, the flux per point source. Uh, lots of individually bright point sources. Uh, we know though that the data doesn't have a ton of bright sources that can explain the excess. Um, if we have a ton of really, really dim point sources, on the other hand, uh, they're going back to looking smooth. So that's not something you can really distinguish from uh, like a smooth dark matter like emission. Uh, this middle scenario, on the other hand, uh, if we have at least moderately bright point sources, is something you can distinguish uh, from a dark matter signal. Um, and that's what uh, we're after. So we want to include the possibility of there being point sources uh, in the model. Uh, so there's a few ingredients that we need for that. Um, one thing is the spatial distribution of point sources. Uh, this just says how point sources are distributed in the sky. Uh, so we're looking for something that's consistent with the galactic center excess. So we have uh, uh, a population on the left uh, that's consistent with the excess. We also expect there to be point sources correlated with the galactic disk. Uh, so we allow for the possibility of uh, a population like that. Uh, we also need uh, a model for how uh, many counts these point sources emit. Um, and this is modeled by what's called a count distribution. Uh, so this is the number of point sources as a function of uh, how many photons they emit. Uh, so if you have something on towards the right, that's a ton of individually bright point sources. Towards the left means you have dimmer point sources. Um, and this we parameterize using a broken power law just to have a flexible distribution. Uh, so we want to now include point sources in this probabilistic model. Uh, so as before, we have the smooth component. Um, I've grouped together all of the, uh, the smooth templates um, in one uh, circle here. So now we have uh, uh, components that model the point source distribution that come from a source count distribution. Uh, these are drawn from some prior or seem to be. Based on this, we can integrate the source count distribution, the NDS, to get these the number of point sources. Uh, the actual number of point sources is some realization of this. This could be a photon, for example. Um, and once we know the number of point sources, we can then uh, draw uh, their counts and their positions in the sky based on the, the template. Uh, and then we plot them in uh, and model the, uh, the expected gamma ray sky, uh, additionally convolving it by the what's called the PSF. This is just a... Um, the resolution of the telescope. Uh, so there's kind of a lot here. And uh, this is again, like an intractable uh, likelihood. Um, and going back to the science point earlier, in part, this is because of this uh, large and discrete latent space um, in the model. So this is not something you can really put into like a probabilistic programming language and uh, uh, click a button and, and get your uh, theta PS and theta smooth. Uh, so again, the simplification that's that's often done is assuming uh, pixel-wise conditional independence. Uh, so here, uh, it's assumed that uh, uh, the different pixels are independent, uh, and what this reduces down to at the end of the day is heuristically looking at the histogram of photon counts. Uh, so, for example, if you have something that's point source-like, that's expected to give a different uh, uh, distribution of 
photons than something that's uh, smooth. Um, for lack of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip uh, some of this, um, and I'll just summarize it. Uh, so essentially, about six years ago, people use this method to find a very strong five or six sigma evidence for point sources. Um, more recently, it was pointed out by uh, Tracy Slatia and Rebecca Lean that uh, under certain circumstances, uh, the method can be biased. Um, and the question people have been asking since then is what could go wrong? Um, and what could go wrong is because we're looking at essentially histograms uh, and the diffuse background makes up about 80% of the emission in this region, uh, even though we can separate out point sources from, from, from dark matter-like emission, because the diffuse background is so prominent, uh, if uh, we mismodel it or misspecify it, uh, this can look like point sources, even if there aren't any, um, or it can look like dark matter. Um, so the past few years, there's been some interest in trying to improve these analyses. Uh, one direction is to build and apply better diffuse models. Um, I, I won't talk about that direction here. I'll just, um, in the last few minutes, uh, summarize um, our, uh, our analysis. Uh, so we asked whether we can improve the analysis instead of modeling the uh, histogram of photon counts, model the full likelihood. Um, so a downside with this uh, histogram method is that it's not sensitive to the spatial ordering of the pixels. So if I take the original data map versus the shuffled data map, both of these have the same histogram. So if I have some kind of model misspecification going on in some part of the sky, uh, that could look like point sources, even though spatially it doesn't look like point sources. Um, so then we asked, can we model the, the full likelihood instead of the per pixel likelihood, um, expecting this to be more robust to uh, background specification than the traditional methods. Um, again, this is kind of a classic uh, setting for a simulation based inference problem. Uh, we can run the simulation in the forward direction and simulate a map with point sources or dark matter, going the other way is hard because of the large latent space. Uh, so in this case, we, we use a different method, uh, not ratio estimation, but uh, uh, density estimation based on normalizing flows. Um, a lot of you are definitely familiar with these. These are just uh, a Swiss army knife for uh, probabilistic modeling. The basic idea here is uh, some base density that's simple that uh, can be sampled from and where we can evaluate the, uh, the density uh, is transformed with a series of one-to-one uh, -one, uh, transformations to a more complex density. Uh, so in this case, I've illustrated this with, with the logo of our, our institute here. Uh, and this transformation is parameters by neural networks um, and um, has a tractable inverse and uh, Jacobian. And the nice thing here is this allows for efficient density estimation in the target space uh, and also efficient sampling because uh, we can sample in the base space and then transform this into uh, the, the target space. In our analysis, we used uh, normalizing flows to model the posterior. So now we have uh, 12 parameters that uh, characterize the distribution of point sources. So the, these are the the breaks and the slopes of uh, the source cloud distributions, and also the smooth components. Uh, and then one nice thing with flows is that you can condition the transformation on anything you want. Uh, so in our case, we uh, we use a, a combination neural network to uh, condition uh, the transformation. Uh, so this way, we model directly the posterior p of theta given. Uh, given X uh, implicitly uh, through, um, through the forward model. And this can then be used to infer the quantities that uh, we're interested in. Uh, so, and I'll mention that- Sorry, a quick question. Sorry. Uh, the feature extractor, how is that uh, trained usually? To... Yes, yeah, good, good question. Uh, so we have a forward model. Uh, where either we sprinkle point sources and smooth emission and, and so on, um, and build up training data. And uh, 
we train the feature extractor at the same time as it normalizes in flow. Uh, so both the, the flow transformation and the feature extraction <clears throat> network are trained at the same time with the training data. And I'll mention that um, there's, uh, there's been complementary work uh, in this series of papers by List et al. Uh, that use Bayesian neural networks and histogram regression. Um, and um, results are very consistent with each other. All right, so we then went on to uh, check this on, on simulated data. Um, so for example, here's a data set with just dark matter. Uh, you can ignore all of the stuff on the left and just focus on uh, these, the, the last column. Uh, the star is where the, the true parameter point is. Uh, this is the joint distribution of point sources and dark matter. So we can see that we can successfully get out dark matter if uh, that's what there. Uh, if we put in point sources on the other hand, again, we can uh, successfully extract uh, in for the, the, the presence of point sources. Um, and then we did a bit of robustness test. So if uh, we, our training data is built with one background model and then tested with another background model, uh, we seem to be okay. We, we don't uh, spuriously infer point sources uh, instead of dark matter. Or if we modulate uh, the diffuse model with uh, some large scale Gaussian process, um, we still seem to be okay. Um, and one reason that this does better than the traditional method is because uh, it's really looking for the presence of point sources at small scales uh, rather than in this kind of projected uh, space of uh, the uh, PDF of photon counts. And uh, we then applied this to the Fermi data uh, to get uh, this uh, distribution on the, the lower right. Um, so you can see that there's some degeneracy between the inferred point source-like and dark matter-like emission. Um, there's no strong preference uh, for point sources, uh, but there's still some. Uh, but you can see it's a lot less than the, the five or six sigma uh, that uh, early analysis um, obtained. Um, it's, yeah, the, I mean, the story is still uh, evolving, I think. Uh, there's better diffuse models um, uh, that um, are constantly in the pipeline. Uh, so I am optimistic that uh, some of these methods uh, hopefully will have a clear idea of what's going on um, in the galactic center. Um, the, the other point is that none of these analyses really use energy information. Uh, so information about the energy spectrum. Uh, and with these kinds of analyses, it's, it's much easier to uh, use that information. So that's something as well that uh, in the future should be uh, very much doable. All right, that brings me to my conclusions, uh, which is just that machine learning assistant SVI is, is well suited for astrophysical dark matter searches, just from the kinds of problem settings that uh, we talk about. Um, and I showed uh, a little bit of a futuristic application to um, astrometric uh, uh, lensing searches, and also we are analyzing some, some old data. Um, with a uh, promise for uh, what can be done in the future. Uh, and code for both of these analyses is on GitHub if uh, anyone's interested. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, are there questions? Okay, so uh, yeah, can you, so um, I, I guess I can look at the, the, the paper as well, but when you said that you're training the feature extractor model at the same time, um, like how, so are you selecting those features as kind of like, they, they're pretty, so what, what selects those features? Is it some like some, you know, astro model essentially that's, um, you know, 
has seen these these features beforehand or is this uh, yeah it, it's a it's a good question it's a little hard to, to get one's head around i think um so imagine we were not conditioning this density estimator on on anything uh say we're just uh trading the flow network by itself um what we would learn is just the prior right um uh, because we have some theta drawn from a prior we have nothing being conditioned this would just learn p of theta the prior um now we have this additional feature extraction network that's uh uh conditioning uh the the transformation so now we're learning the posterior p of theta given x um so what selects these summaries um is whatever this is a, a bit of a like heuristic we're putting this but whatever gives uh, uh a posterior that's compatible with uh the input theta or you know it, it creates a set of summaries that gives a good posterior basically that that does well at density estimation I see. Um, yeah, and, and, and the summaries in this case are not um, informative. So the summaries are just uh, some features extracted from the CNN that are directly used to condition uh, the flow. Uh, in principle, one could try and extract some uh, sufficient summaries beforehand, um, or just use some physically informed set of summaries uh, that uh, you extract from the data. So for example, you take your map, do a PCA or some kind of nonlinear PCA, uh, and then input that as a condition in context. Um, and we, we've tried that, you know, it does kind of okay. Uh, but uh, in this case, I guess it's trying, uh, it gives a narrow posterior is I guess a rough way to say it, um, because it, it tries to extract features that um, are around or that, that give a transformation uh, that gives a density around uh, the true point um, as well as possible. There's a question, Michael Church. Hey, uh, nice talk. I, so we have here your feature extractor operating on X. Um, uh, I'm curious about, I've, I've seen some different things from various groups on the dimensionality of theta that's possible um, using normalizing flows in SBI and some of the um, more traditional methods. Um, I, I don't know if you've explored this or do you have a handle on how large of a, uh, a theta parameter space can, can be successfully done with these techniques? Um, that's a good question. Um, I didn't really explore this. In our case, we have 18 parameters. Um, and, and these are, you know, parameters of interest, uh, but there are flow architectures out there that can model, for example, images, uh, no problem, uh, right, which are like 256 by 256 or, or whatever. Um, of course, those are more um, um, specialized architectures. Um, but if you just scale up the number of parameters, uh, then I'm not sure. My, my intuition is it should be okay. I mean, you, you might need more training data or you might want to use methods that are more uh, sample efficient. Um, but I think in terms of just the density estimation part, um, it should be okay. Yeah, that's just intuition. Any more questions? All right, so I cannot see any more coming up. So let's thank Sid for a very nice talk again. And um, yeah, thanks for tuning in.